to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundbey felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. Hello friends of the Flora and Friends podcast and welcome to this new episode. Today is a solo episode with me where I will take you on a time travel back into the time when plants started to colonize the land and we will learn and understand there why it is so important that plants do interact with fungi and we will finish on the importance of fungi in our forests today and what we can do to protect this rich diversity that helped the forest ecosystem so much. My name is Judith and I am a researcher studying the interaction of trees with soil fungi. I have been carrying out this research since my own PhD project and even today where I have my own research group. We are studying many different aspects of the communication between tree roots and fungi, but also what it means when we cut down trees in the forest. And I will let you know a bit more about this later in the post podcast. But while we start, I want to take you on a little time travel to a time about 450 million years ago when Earth definitely didn't look alike what it is today. There were no trees, there were no big plants, there were very high CO2 levels still in the air because all our green ecosystem hadn't developed. There were algae and cyanobacteria in the water so they could produce somewhat uh, of oxygen, but our lands were devoid of any, yeah, plants basically. So plants started to develop at this time and the basic plants that we got at that time were bryophytes so you have liverwort and hornwort and mosses for example. You know these plants don't really have roots and they don't really have real leaves. They have much more basic structure which are called rhizoids and they were starting to colonize the land. Now before that we have already had green algae and aquatic fungi that were making um, a common lifestyle. So there was some kind of an interaction between the green life, the algae and the fungi which need to absorb sugar. And the algae, they are capable of making sugar because they can make uh, sugar through photosynthesis. And this interaction of fungi with algae or with cyanobacteria, we still have this today in the form of lichens. But lichens will only be the subject of our next episode. So we are keeping to the plants here. So these very basic plants actually, yeah, actually did they interact with fungi or not? That was a research question that researchers had asked themselves for more than 40 years. And there's different ways of approaching such a question in order to find answers. One of them is looking for fossils. But the oldest fossil of an interaction of a plant with a fungus is 407 million years old. So that dates pretty long back, but we are sometimes there around 450 million years. So a little further back than this oldest fossil. So what researchers have done uh, from the CNRS in Toulouse, and this was published this year in the journal Science, is they took one of these basic plants, the liverwort, and they studied the function of some of the genes in these plants. Now, I'm going to talk later on also about genome sequencing and 
I think I want to give you a little analogy if you are very unfamiliar with this. If you think back in time and you wonder how our villages and cities looked like 500 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, you may be able to go back to old church books. And in the old church book, you would have entries when people were born, what their names were, maybe also what their professions were. Some of the names will tell you professions. If you take the millers or the shoemakers or the smith, you know probably very well what they were doing and what their function was in the village. And from there, you could also see maybe how well developed this village was. So when we do genome sequencing, that is approximately the same thing that we do. It's like looking in old church books Instead, we look into the genomes of the plants. The genome is made out of plenty of letters and we can understand these letters. These letters make genes. It's like making names, basically. And then we study what the function of these names are. So basically like studying what the function of different people in a village was. And researchers in Toulouse have done this. They have um, identified in the liverwort a specific gene that is very similar to one that still today is used for plants to make interaction with fungi. And what they have done is they have taken it away and they have observed if this plant can still form a symbiosis with a fungus. And the answer was no, it's not capable of this anymore. That's basically the same if you would remove the smiths from a village and you would see what happens to the whole village. Well, they may not get any weapons anymore. So you see there's no weapons, there's no war, they may do different activities. Then you understand the smith was responsible for making the swords in the village. That's basically the same what we do with the genes and the genomes. So... When researchers understood this, they also uh, studied whether there was a transfer possible between the fungus and the plant of nutrients. And they saw indeed that this fungus and the liverwort were capable of exchanging nutrients with each other. So that proved to them that this very early land plant was capable of making a symbiotic relationship with fungi. And this has also given us an answer that probably 450 years, million years ago, this colonization of land plants happened in the presence and with the help of the fungi. Now the fungi have a cap capacity to make large networks of um, hyphae in the soil even though back in the days soil wasn't necessarily what was there there was a lot of rocks and stones but they also have the capacity to split this and to take up nutrients from this environment and to provide it to the plant and especially if the plant has no real roots that can be a very important interaction for this plant with the fungi that can explore and make available nutrients from this rocky soils. And the fungus benefits from the plant because the plant is absorbing light and CO2 and is providing um, sugars or lipids to the fungus. So basically carbon for the fungus to grow and to make a wider network and to explore even more of the soil to take up nutrients. That is what it is all about even today in the interaction of fungi and plants. Now moving on through history from 450 million years ago to the time when trees developed. The oldest fossil trees has been found uh, in the USA and studied by a researcher called Bill Stein from Binghamton University in New York. And this tree, this oldest fossil tree was dated to 385 million years ago. There's an amazing picture of this fossil tree stem um, 
in an article and I will link this in our blog post so that you can appreciate that yourself. I mean, this is, I can't imagine these things without seeing them, especially as they are so, so old. But this has shown that trees developed at that time and whereas the fossil records were not so good actually to really know whether these trees had an interaction with fungi or not. Again, here genome sequencing could help us in, in order to see how old the different parts of the symbiosis and the different functions of the symbiosis actually are. Because there, um, in a very recent um, article from 2020, um, researchers have sequenced 135 fungal genomes, so like looking into 135 villages and seeing what was there and they could understand more about the symbiosis and how old the oldest of this symbiosis of fungi that are still living today, so not of all of them that lived 450 million years ago exist still today, um, but they could date the interaction of trees with fungi to probably about 200 million years ago. Um, and even though the fossils that we now have from trees and, um, and fungi are much younger. So they, the fossils are helpful because they can be a good proof for what was really there, but they are also difficult to access. So having these tools with the genomes is um, excellent to be able to understand how our world around us was shaped. So the oldest trees were a bit different than our trees today. They were reproducing using spores and only later on they started to make seeds. And then only later on the flowering plants actually developed and all the insects. And then we had even more seeds and seeds is even what feeds us today. And through the evolution of the forest ecosystem, CO2 levels were also sinking because the trees were taking up the carbon dioxide and fixing it into their biomass. So our world really started to change when the forests appeared and is much more alike of what we have there today. So 200 million years ago, the the um, family of Pinacea started to evolve and with that a different type of symbiosis and it's also a symbiosis with fungi but these fungi are a little bit different whereas the first group of fungi that I've talked about that evolved together with the land plants they are called abuscular mycorrhizal fungi they actually require a fungal partner in order to uh, a plant partner in order to grow and they grow into the cells of the roots so first they they find their way into the root and then they make a little like a tree shaped structure in the cells of the root and that's where they can exchange plenty of nutrients with the plant that's why this kind of tree shaped structure is so great because it enhances the sur surface for their interaction the other type of uh, fungal symbiosis that I want to talk more about today is called the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis. And the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis is of its structure a bit different. And that was for the first time observed and described by a person called Theodor Hartig in 1842. He observed when he cuts the roots that there is kind of a labyrinthine network of fungi growing in between of the cells. So in the endomycorrhiza, as I said, you have this tree-shaped structure inside of the cells, whereas in the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis, you have the fungus just in between of the cells and around the root as well. So that's how they are different. And the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis is especially prominent and important for trees, so for our forest and for shrubs. That's this type of interaction that exists. 
it's very widespread in terms of surface area between the boreal forests up here in the north down to the Mediterranean, whereas the abuscular mycorrhizal or the endomycorrhizal symbiosis, as I initially said, exists with about 80% of land plants in many, many different areas. But as we're talking about the forest and the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis is important for that, I want us to focus on that relationship here and now. So the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis is also very interesting in terms of how it actually occurred. And by looking at these different genomes, researchers have identified that it must have evolved more than 80 times and different places and at different times in the evolution of land plants and trees in particular, which means that it can be very different depending on which type of tree you are looking at or which type of fungus you are looking at. And that is very interesting for us researchers on its own that when we study one relationship of one fungus with one tree, this may be different than the other relationship of another tree with another fungus. But trees usually get colonized by many, many different fungi on their root system. So if you would dig up a small seedling and you would look under a microscope at the root system, you would probably discover that the roots are surrounded by either fluffy fungus or very smooth fungus. Maybe you have brown one, maybe you have yellow one and orange one. There's some white ones, there can be some black ones. So as the fungi make a very large diversity above ground when they make their fruiting bodies now in the fall, they also have a very large diversity in how they look like below ground. And they make a network between the trees and connect the different trees to each other. So that diversity is very complex and we, um, we call this kind of network of fungi through the soil the wood white web, which is also a very nice analogy to the World Wide Web that we are using. We are also connected to each other through the internet and basically the fungi are the internet of the forest soils and they also allow trees to send signals to each other and to send nutrients to each other and on this way to support each other depending on their growth conditions or parental trees may support smaller trees by this kind of connection of the roots through a fungal network. So why is the symbiosis important for us? As I explained earlier, the fungus benefits from the tree by having access to sugars from the photosynthesis because it's living underground and it can't be doing photosynthesis itself. The tree, on the other hand, benefits from nutrients and the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis, they can gather both nitrogen and phosphorus and provide that to the tree. In very recent research, we have um, actually wondered, and that's a collaboration partner of, of mine who has conducted these studies, we have wondered if in very poor forest soils, where nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen are not so abundant, is actually the fungus wanting to provide these nutrients to the tree. And it seems to, to our knowledge to date that the fungus needs to have a certain amount of nitrogen and a certain amount of carbon, and the ratio between this will help it to grow. So it matches carbon and nitrogen to grow. So when it gets carbon from the tree, it will match it up with the nitrogen and develop its fungal network below ground. And when there is more nitrogen available, so when we, for example, fertilize a bit there in the forest, there's more nitrogen also going up into the tree because the fungus has leftover nitrogen basically that it can provide to the tree. This is a very difficult relationship and it's some kind of a market analysis between the fungus and the tree that is required to really understand how these two interact with each other. And it's interesting, There, you may wonder, how can you study this interaction? 
uh, and the nutrient transfer. So there is different ways of doing this. You can, for example, shade a tree, especially when you have small setups in the greenhouse. You can shade one of the trees and it may be connected to other trees through this fungal network. And then you can see how the nutrients are flowing between the different individual trees that are either shaded or non-shaded. Because when they are shaded, they get less sun, so they produce less sugars. And we assume they can provide less sugar to their fungal partner. Another way of doing this is um, in the forest by girdling a tree, which means you remove the outer bark on a, on a ring around the stem. The sugars from the photosynthesis, they are transported through the phloem down into the roots. And that sits in this outer, outer part of the stem. So when you girdle the tree and you remove this, basically the tree cannot transport its sugars down into the root anymore. And then you can also study what happens to this interaction when you remove the sugar source of the, of the tree. In other ways, what you can do is you can supply um, nitrogen, labeled nitrogen, that you can actually detect then after what's in the tree by putting this onto the forest soil and then seeing what happens actually to this nutrient exchange when you prevent the tree of providing carbon, for example. So there's many different setups and some are huge. There you have really tents in the forest that are built above the trees so that you can also feed labeled CO2, labeled carbon dioxide to the tree and can really study where it ends up in the soil because you want to distinguish this carbon that you put on the tree as compared to the carbon that is already in normal air to see what happens when you start your experiment. But you can also do that very small scale in a petri dish in the lab, basically. So many different ways of studying this market um, between the trees and the fungus. But there's also more than just um, positive effects of the nutrient exchange for both of these partners. The roads are also protected from drought because the fungus grows a mantle around it and thereby makes already a physical protection but it can also change the nutrient absor absorption from the soil because usually when the tree wants to absorb nitrogen it sucks it up together with water which means it needs to suck up water in order to get the nitrogen but by interacting with the fungus, it can gain nitrogen in a different way, so it doesn't need to absorb as much water with it, which can be especially beneficial when it's very dry outside. Another advantage can be protection against any kind of pests that are living in the soil. Also there you have a physical barrier around the root. And today we are even studying what is happening in the upper part of the stem when the roots are colonized by this beneficial fungi. Is in the leaves or in the needles anything ongoing that would make the stem more resistant or the whole tree more resistant? This makes actually sense for us because if the fungus wants to ensure that it gets nutrients, which sugars from the tree, then it may want to give its tree partner some advantages so that it survives better. So if the tree is more resistant to pests that would attack the needles or the leaf, the fungi may ensure a better, um, yeah, a better flow of carbon to the roots. So, and in very destroyed sites, like where you have industries having been, or you have maybe other impacts on the environment and the soil is very much degraded or it's enriched in heavy metals or in other um, contaminants from industry, these fungi can actually help plants to establish. So establishing plants on such sites in order to clean up the soil is called phytoremediation. And in order for plants to thrive there, protection by the fungus can help 
them resist to these contaminants or to the heavy metals because the fungus is, is very often very good at absorbing this and even converting and destroying this or in just keeping it and keeping it away on in this way from the plant. But the fungus, by making a network through the soil, also stabilizes the soil when these plants are planted on a side of erosion where you have like a very sandy side and then you have a lot of wind blowing their establishment of a fungus can really help compact the soil and give the plants hold so there's many different ways uh, how fungi can benefit plant establishment on difficult sites but they are even around in our forest and then I'm coming to one last aspect that I want to share, and that is forestry practice and how this impacts our soil biodiversity. So in Sweden today, it's very common to do clear cuts. So basically you cut down on a large area of forest, all the trees. So what happens there is that you basically remove these um trees so the sugar source for the fungus the fungi sit in the soil and they will over a certain amount of time be able to feed on the dead roots these ectomycorrhizal type of fungi that grow together with shrubs and trees they have evolved from what is called the saprophytic or saprotrophic fungi and white and brown rot fungi so these fungi were able to degrade dead biomass back in the days and through evolution, they have learned to grow in symbiotic relationships with living plants, so to not feed on dead plants, but to live on, on living plants. And with that, they have lost some of their mechanisms to degrade dead biomass. And they have learned to gain this symbiotic capacity to communicate with the tree and not to start degrading it while it's alive. <laughs> so, so they became a little bit less dangerous for their tree partners here. And they have kept some of the mechanisms that are required for degrading dead biomass. So... Many of them, over a shorter amount of time, they can live on a site where the trees have been removed and where no sugars are coming from the photosynthesis to the roots. But eventually, when we cut down the trees like this, there's many different changes happening. The, the soil is much more exposed to sun. It's getting drier. Um, you don't have the shading of the trees, you don't have the biomass falling down, the leaves or the needles. Uh, you have pH changes in the soil. So there's many, many different variations going on after a site has cut down. And that can impact the fungi as well. If they are fungi that prefer a certain nutrient status or a certain humidity in the soil or a certain temperature, um, they may just disappear from this site or they will disappear because they do not get any nutrients anymore. So when these sites of clear cut are replanted, usually two years later, what we see is that the community of fungi in the soil has actually changed and that can make the establishment of new trees more suboptimal. So what researchers have done and studied and what forest companies are also doing today, they pick a certain number of trees, which are called the mother trees. And these trees are then kept alive. They're kept standing. So if you sometimes go into clear cut, you will see that there's st trees still standing there. And um, when you study if that helps to conserve the fungal biodiversity in the soil, you will see that in about a radius of 10 to 15 meter, these retained retention trees, they also call some call them mother trees, some call them retention trees. These trees, they conserve the biodiversity in this radius of 10 to 15 meter. But when you go beyond this distance, you will lose biodiversity as well. So if you look now at such a site and you see how many trees are conserved there, you may conserve in some patches um, the biodiversity of the communities, but not in all larger areas. 
So which means we are today studying if there could be alternative forest harvesting systems where you don't harvest on a whole side, but you maybe harvest in small gaps. If this can help to conserve better the diversity of the fungi in the soil. Yes, so taken together in a little summary, <laughs> Let's see, a little summary. That was a lot of information, uh, but maybe some of you have picked up on different aspects. So what we know today is that the colonization of the land by plants was facilitated by fungi. And this would have been fungi of the endomycorrhizal lifestyle. And... Later on, when trees evolved, also they evolved a new type of symbiosis with ectomycorrhizal fungi that is much younger than the endomycorrhizal fungi. And they have evolved many, many, many times at different places and at different sites. And that is why the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis has many different mechanisms of how it works in interaction with the trees. And the endomycorrhizal symbiosis is much more conserved in how it works. And we know much more about the endomycorrhizal symbiosis. But the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis is highly important for our forest ecosystems. They can benefit the tree in different ways, through helping with nutrition, through protecting them from stresses. And there's much research still needed to really understand how the symbiotic relationship is established, how it is maintained, how our human activity is disturbing it, and how we can improve our activities to conserve this biodiversity much more. We have also heard that algae and cyanobacteria already had an interaction with fungi and that this has led to the evolution of lichens. And lichens is what we will talk about in our next episode and we will hear much more about what they are in an interview again. And well, until then, I will invite you to a little blog post where I will actually link the literature that I have mentioned in this podcast um, to the in the blog post text. And I will also link to some of the pictures where you can see this 385 million year old fossil tree, which I think is just so impressive. It's just amazing to think about how Earth looked like and what plants on Earth have made possible in an evolutionary context and how they make our life today possible here on Earth. And not just plants, but to a very large extent, the interaction of plants with fungi. Have a lovely day and I will see you back here for the next episode. Bye bye.